In this episode of the Happiness Challenge, we're going to be talking about how to get around biology. In the last episode, we talked about how our, our happiness level, our happiness baseline, is incredibly stable over our lifetime. And there were two reasons we mentioned for that. The first is temperament, that happiness, just like personality, just like IQ, are incredibly stable over time. We might have wonderful things that happen to us. We might have horrible things that happen, happen to us. But our happiness will return back to that baseline that we're genetically predisposed to. The second thing that's getting in the way of happiness, being more than what it could be, is this concept, this concept of hedonistic adaptation, where we are really good at getting used to whatever's going on, whether for good or bad. We're adaptive creatures. Now, this is a double-edged sword. Because on the one hand, what this means is that really good things end up not feeling as, as great as they did to begin with. What this also means, the more to our benefit, is that painful experiences, things like losing a, a loved one, divorce, well, those things hurt, but we're able to recover from them as well. Now, none of this is to say we don't care about our marriage or our kids. We don't care about our losses. That is not what we're talking about here. You know, for anyone who's lost a parent or a child, that pain hurts. But years later, the same level of happiness that you had before those losses and before those beautiful moments, well, a few years after the fact, you're going to have the same levels of happiness this general sense of well-being. Now, it's important not to confuse the two because a part of how we're looking at happiness is not, like we talked about in the last video, finding happiness. It's something that we, we need to build. And we, we're, we're, we're not writing off the things we find. You know, it is important who we're married to. It is important those losses. They are meaningful. But that's the catch. In our happiness level, what gives us a meaningful, a rich, uh, a, a worthwhile life, well, it's how much we tap in to those meaningful things. How much we buy into this idea it's something that we need to build and maintain. You know, people can let their marriages fall apart. That happens. You know, I, I've, I've seen statistics where about 20 to 25 percent of people feel satisfied in their marriage. Well, what about the other 80 percent? These, these things can fall apart, but they're not out of our hands. So we're left with this question. How can we get around our biology? <clears throat> so to get a better sense of this, it's worth breaking apart what are the three major influences of our happiness? We've only talked about one, our genetic set point. And research has come out through different twin studies or comparative studies of different demographics. That, that, that's roughly about 50% of our happiness level is genetic. So it's really cool, you know, you're comparing people, getting back to marriage, people who are happy. 25% of people, I said, uh, would report being very happy with their marriage and, and happy more specifically with life in general. Well, about 20% of singles would rank their lives the same way. You know, if we were to take, you know, look, look at money, you know, a lot of people think the more money you have, the happier you'll be. So looking at people who are earning $10 million or more and comparing their happiness level to office staff and blue collar workers, well, they're, they're only slightly more happy with their lives. So what, what this all goes to show is that we have a, a, a happiness set point. But more importantly, these two facts go into describing the second factor, circumstance. Roughly 10% of circumstances in our lives go into our happiness level. Again, marriage it does something, it's true, but not a whole lot. Having lots of money, it does make us happy, but not a whole lot. 
and roughly, like I said, is about 10% of our happiness level. So adding all that up, what's left? We have 40% of our goal-directed behavior, the things that we do in building our lives that are outside of circumstances and outside of our genetics. And that can be rough to hear. A lot of people don't believe it. And, you know, I would challenge people in their assumption that their circumstances are more important than what they do. You know, it's a common experience for people to wake up in the middle of the night and beat themselves up over what they did or didn't do. It's, n it's not so common people waking up in that cold sweat, beating themselves up over their life circumstance. Usually that's what keeps us from falling asleep to begin with. But, but the point's well taken. That we, we all do have this intuitive sense that our life is in our hands that we are masters of our own destiny. Now, we can't write off genetics and we can't write off circumstance, but we, we also need to get with this idea that it might not be that circumstances are as big as we intuitively sense, that instead this other intuition of our, our own mastery, of our free will, well, that's real too. And, and that makes up 40% of what goes into making us have, enabling us to have happy lives. So giving a, a rough outline, you know, when, when looking at the research, what are the most common, uh, uh, common traits that people who are extremely happy have? Well, they spend a lot of time with their family and friends. They're comfortable expressing gratitude. They're often the first to help in a situation, and these people are committed deeply to values and goals in their lives. Now, if we stop and look at this list, it's easy to see how we could fail in every single one and not cash in on the happiness we could have. You know, spending time with family and friends, speak with anybody who's retired, and they'll tell you, looking back on their life, the one regret that they have is they didn't spend as much time with family and friends. You know, Harvard University has a famous study where they tracked uh, their, their, uh, their different classes that had gone through their doors, and it was a longitudinal study. So we're talking, I think it was about 100 years of research. And these people, they were following presidents. They were following uh, important figures in the world. And, you know, these people made gigantic differences. You know, one, for example, was, was JFK. And every single one of those participants, no matter how important or how big of an impact they made professionally, they all, they all shared that their biggest regret was that they didn't spend enough time with family and friends. There's that, there's that stress, what we put our lives into. We often think what will make us happy is, is having that, having that, uh, having that, placard on the door with your name shining on it, with that fancy desk, with that corner office. But when it's all said and done, what really makes us happy is the time we spend with the people we care about. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tension. That's not easy to get behind. What about expressing gratitude? Most people hate expressing gratitude towards what they receive and towards just themselves in general. Having self-compassion for themselves is very difficult. You know, I think people are more careful giving, uh, giving their pets their prescribed medication from their doctors than taking the prescribed medication that they themselves need. You know, th this sense of showing gratitude, receiving gratitude, being compassionate towards oneself. To many people, strikes is... Some people think of it as selfish. Some people think of it as weak. There's a tension there also. You know, people having the idea that you have to push hard, push, push more. To have a better life, you have to work. And, and that's true. You do have to work. But without the gratitude, that's called slavery. Being the first to help. Well, a lot of people are afraid of being taken advantage of. 
you know, here in Israel, no one wants to be called a friar. But it doesn't correlate with happiness. And being committed to values and goals in life, that one's technically difficult. Being able to articulate specifically what, what creates that passion, what you want to live for, well, that's hard enough. But then act, actually sitting down and creating actionable goals, one step after another that leads toward this value, that's, that's very hard to do. So you see, while this list sounds, and sounds oh, you know, easy enough, each one has a tripwire that our brains trip over that end up taking away from the happiness that we can be experiencing. So that's, looking at this list, that's exactly what this video series is going to be trying to address. We'll be peeling apart not just the things on this list, but other tripwires that our brains lie to us about that keep us from building the happiness that we deserve. In the next video, we're going to be getting into measuring, measuring happiness. How can we put a number to our experience to figure out our own baseline so that when we move forward, we'll be able to tell for sure that this happiness challenge is working, that we can dare to be happier. If you found this video useful, go ahead and give it a like, share it with your friends. I'd love to hear your comments in the comments section, what you guys are doing to increase your own happiness and what, what sort of skills and techniques are working best for you. And if you like this work, you can support me on Patreon.